Thank you so much, Sergio. Thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation. Thank you to SPIE for another very exciting evening. Um, as, as Sergio pointed out, it is a major challenge to fit all of this in 10 minutes, and I normally speak pretty slowly, so I'll have to pick up the pace. So I'd like to talk about work that we're doing in breast cancer uh, with our optical technologies. And uh, first, I would like to acknowledge my, my colleagues and collaborators. Um, this is a, a multi-year effort. Wow, that slide looks very funny. <laughs> I hope they don't all look like that. That one looks good. Um, colleagues and collaborators from our cancer center, uh, I, I guess most of them are actually in some strange virtual place if they're not actually showing up on the slide, uh, and our collaborators with the American College of Radiology. So let me give you a brief outline. Uh, I'll introduce to you the clinical need for this work, um, a bit of a technical background, I'll talk about a national multicenter trial that we've established, and then I'll speculate on some future directions. So first, in terms of articulating our clinical need in cancer, in particular in solid tumors in breast, over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been tremendous growth in the use of pre-surgical neoadjuvant chemotherapy techniques. This is chemotherapy before surgery. It's very much uh, uh, specific for stage two to four tumors, and this is estimated to be about 20% of all breast cancer cases that are presented to the clinicians. So typically a patient will undergo about six months of chemotherapy, and hopefully the tumor will shrink. These are dynamic contrast enhanced MRI images of a tumor uh, prior to and several months after chemotherapy. The idea is that if you can shrink the tumor before surgery, it improves the surgical outcome you can begin treatment of possible nodes and metastases right away. And if there's a complete pathologic response, that is, if the pathologist says at surgery there's no residual disease, then these patients have better five-year survival than patients without a complete pathologic response. But the problem is about one in five patients don't respond to chemotherapy at all, and about only one in three achieve pathologic complete response. So the clinical need is to predict pathologic complete response as early as possible. And the impact of this is one could envision having bedside approaches that would allow us to customize treatment, provide feedback to oncologists, and optimize that treatment for individuals. So in the world of cancer imaging, if you are in optics, you're typically off in a parenthesis on the side. So these are the main modalities that are used in cancer imaging. And of course, they're all being applied to looking at neoadjuvant chemotherapy response in breast cancer and in other cancers. We first described in 2004 a single patient study with thousands of measurements following that individual over several months of chemotherapy. Kind of an interesting note here is we couldn't get this published in any cancer journals because of the criticism that we only had one patient. So of course, we made thousands of measurements on one patient, and this is what everybody wants to do for the future in terms of individualizing therapy. Now, as our field grows, many other groups have been involved in this, and over about the last 10 years, several groups around the world, there are about 30 publications describing how optics can be used to monitor and predict this type of uh, response. So let me give you a little bit of technical background on the therapy, on, the, on how we're making these measurements. So we, we use diffuse optics, and this is the very beautiful picture of the field. Uh, this is me, and I have a few 850 nanometer near-infrared LEDs in my mouth. Uh, my picture is being taken by a Canon Rebel camera with the IR blocking filter removed. This is my colleague Albert Sarusi, that's his hand. You can probably recognize us both from our near-infrared images. So there's no external illumination, and the very beautiful part about this is that there's a lot of light that comes through very thick tissues, propagating through bone, soft tissue, over several centimeters. But the very difficult part is we have no idea what the path length is, and it's difficult to quantify those images. So our field has been working on a number of approaches to do that. The technology that we've been working on is a combination of frequency domain photon migration, where we have six semiconductor diode lasers that are swept up to 400 megahertz, they're detected with an avalanche photodiode. 
This is combined with white light, CW near-infrared spectroscopy, broadband techniques, where the reflectance is measured with a spectrometer. This is combined both in hardware and also in the computation that we do to look at the wavelength dependence of scattering and absorption as measured by the photon migration to, uh, arm of the technology. And we can involve this with the uncalibrated broadband DC reflectance. What comes out is scatter corrected absorption spectra. And any place that we put our probe, if there is a tumor beneath the surface, we'll see a perturbation in that spectra in these regions, the water, lipid, oxy, and deoxyhemoglobin regions. So because we do scatter corrected spectra, we can quantify those components. And there's significant functional contrast in cancer. First, there's elevated blood due to increased tumor vascularity. There's elevated water content due to tumor edema and tumor cellular proliferation. Cells are mostly water. And there's diminished lipid. Tumors displace bulk lipid as they grow. So this is a, uh, these are images of data that we've acquired for a patient, really illustrating that concept. Tumors create their own optical contrast. This is a scan of the normal side. It's about a 10 by 10 centimeter region of the breast that's being scanned. And these are maps of oxyhemoglobin concentration, deoxyhemoglobin concentration, water content, and lipid content. And you can see there's contrast in each of these parameters, which has underlying biological origins. We can make indices that are composed of every one of those components. And this is a composite index that we use quite often for endpoint studies. It's a combination of deoxyhemoglobin in water divided by lipid. The numerator of this index, these are components that increase in cancer. And in the denominator, this is a component that decreases. And you can see very nicely that we can have two to up to 20-fold contrast based on these endogenous signals. So let me tell you what we're doing with this type of technology. Two years ago, we kicked off a multi-center trial. It actually took more than three years to organize and put all of the uh, proper agreements and protocols in place and approvals from the National Cancer Institute. This is supported by the American College of Radiology Imaging Network, which never has done an optics trial before. So it has five original sites that you can see around the country. Many of my colleagues are here tonight. We added two additional sites just in 2013 in order to enhance our enrollment. So over two years, we've enrolled 60 patients. That's the completion of the enrollment phase of the trial. We'll end the final chemotherapy patient in February of this year. The original five sites have a platform that's quite large and looks like this. This is based on a design that we froze in 2007 using a commercially available network analyzer as our RF source for our semiconductor sources. We've been able to miniaturize the technology over the years, and this is a portable system that's now at MD Anderson in Boston University, and also we've brought one to Saitama in Japan. I recently actually brought one to Africa where there's some very interesting challenges, difficult challenges, in staging or downstaging breast cancer in populations where they are typically presenting at stage four with five to six centimeter diameter tumors. I carried that in the overhead, so in all the way to Africa, just to sort of give you a feeling of how portable it is. So the objectives in the study, and this is our primary aim, we're looking at whether the baseline to mid-therapy changes of our tissue optical index are predictive of a final pathologic complete response. And that final response is our clinical endpoint. So we have an optical endpoint and a clinical endpoint. The clinical endpoint is a surrogate for five-year survival for patients. I'll just show you a couple of cases. Here's one case where a patient is being followed at baseline, a one-week measurement, mid-therapy and post-therapy, and you can see those changes. Here's another case where the changes are not quite as dramatic, and you can see that they're are differences in both of these cases, we don't know exactly what the response is of these patients. I'll summarize some of our future directions. Some questions are whether or not we can predict as early as possible whether patients respond. And here's a series of studies, 17 subjects, 
where we saw that there is a flare response in oxyhemoglobin just one day after the first round of chemotherapy. That flare response may help us identify non-responders. We've also looked at saturation even before chemotherapy starts, and we've seen, on average, patients who are complete responders have higher saturation than non-complete responders. And my colleague Ching Zhu at UConn has seen similar results looking at total hemoglobin as a predictive biomarker. And finally, we've been able to look at breast density using optical techniques, correlate density with water and deoxyhemoglobin content, and it's possible to use this as a, as a way of assessing risk and determining response to hormone-blocking therapies such as tamoxifen. Recently, we've been able to achieve full mapping of the entire breast. You can see metabolism of the areolar complex in the oxyhemoglobin and the water signals here. And these are very powerful, I think, for being able to look at density and risk. So I'll try to summarize. These techniques, optical methods, are sensitive to tumor perfusion, metabolism, and composition. And there's potential to use this as predictive or prognostic biomarkers. Therapy-induced changes can be monitored frequently at the bedside. That could potentially be used for the oncologist to optimize therapy for individual patients. These principles can be generalized to other solid tumors, and we and other groups are looking at colorectal cancer, head and neck, and sarcomas. So I think there's lots of potential applications to these. And finally, the adoption of these methods requires our community to take the lead in outcome-based studies. Evidence-based medicine and personalized care are the ideas or the concepts that are carrying medicine forward, and we have to be in that game as well. Finally, our funding and our team, and we're, we're worshiping here our small portable device uh, standing around that. So thank you very much.